Uh, Ness O'Connor is um, at the Center for Irish Studies at NUI Galway. She's also the co-director of Omosaita and the Spicy Place uh, Reading Group at Galway and co-convener of the International Network Mapping Spectral Traces. Most recently, you might have seen her on the news report on Sunday night at TG4, uh, where she was interviewed um, with the Rambling House event that she coordinated with Rianoff and Neil Tim and Tim Collins. Um, and we had a little bit of assistance from the youth, but um, they put together this amazing event on body, space, and memory. Um, so I invite you to also go to the Onsite and Center for Irish Studies webpage to learn more about her recent work. And um, we know her very well in geography. Irish um, geogra cultural geography is definitely enhanced by the writings and presence of NASA in um, both conferences and in publications. So um, we're really delighted to have her here. Thank you very much. Uh, well, as the, uh, the admittedly the non-geographer here at the party, I'd like to uh, thank um, everybody to Newf for the kind invitation to be here today. Um, I, I caught what I originally thought I was going to talk about because I didn't have as much time. Uh, but I would like uh, so I'm really going to focus on uh, Miles McGopolin and uh, Marissa O'Sullivan as well uh, in terms of looking at Irish immigrant geographies. Um, I presented a, kind of a different version of this focused on a particular map a couple of years ago, but it was looking at the idea of Gaelthog spaces, and I reframed it to look at the idea of emigrant geographies, pathways, and mobilities in a way as well, and looking at how the idea of Ireland and Irish space has been contested and destabilised, primarily maybe by people writing in both the Irish and the English languages, and in a way looking at uh, a different way of looking at Irish space, maybe before the sociologists got their hands on it as well. <laughs> Uh, so I think what I'm going to say today could fit into landscape, literature, poverty, po poverty colonialism, religion and knowledge uh, because it does deal with Flannan Bryan, who we know is the arbiter of all things Irish. So uh, I, I will uh, start very, very quickly. Uh, in May 1897, uh, 1897, an Irish fair was held at the Grand, Palace, uh, Grand Central Palace in New York to raise funds for an Irish palace building, a site that will contain a library, a shooting range and a riding school. Uh, three pastimes, of course, essential for Irish, any Irish immigrant uh, in New York. Uh, one of the most popular exhibits on display is a large topographical map of Ireland that stretched across the floor. It was divided into 32 parts, each section representing the exact contours of each county. But the, but the attraction of the map lay not in the idea that one could walk across it and thereby step foot on Ireland once again, but that each of these counties had been filled with soil from home that was attested as being genuine and authentic. The Irish emigrant could therefore once again set foot on the soil of old Ireland. Uh, and Dirk Dugillon uh, of Notre Dame is looking at the representation of, of Ireland in world fairs uh, in the 19th and early 20th centuries uh, in particular as well. In a recent uh, tele television advertisement for Kerry Gold Butter entitled Made of Ireland, the Irish emigrant comes home to his, uh, his rural Irish home place with his German wife. The ad opens with the unnamed male emigrant digging up some soil from the family farm and then cuts to the kitchen table where his wife says to his mother and I'll now have it the terrifying voice of the Irish mammy uh, oh, yes, sorry, the, the, the daughter-in-law saying Angela, we we'll miss your cooking in Berlin very bad <laughs> The Irish mother, ever quick to offer a retort to the woman that took her son away from her quickly replies I shall expect that they export all our best stuff The ad finishes with the male emigrant surmising He'll be born in Germany with his speech, speech will touch Irish soil first. I'm just going to play a very brief um, clip of this. <laughs> One of the comments on YouTube that took up far more of my time than it should have was that the child that embedded in this is Michael Fassbender. So this is actually Michael Fassbender's parents. Fassbender. <laughs> Angela, we'll miss your cooking in Berlin. At least we have Kerry Gold there too. I'm sure. Export all our best stuff. Say <laughs> <laughs> turn. He'll be born in Germany. But his feet will touch Irish soil first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> from the uh, bizarrely comfortable looking bus, Aaron Bus, 
And there are over a hundred years between these two instances of the representation of Irish soil being dug up and moved around for a mobile Irish emigrant community, but the basic ideology is the same. Despite the mobility of Irish migrants and the diverse kinds of emigrant pathways that pertain to class, gender, ethnicity and language, the trope of the attachment to the soil, the home place, is one that has retained occurrence in the Irish imagination. Historian Joe Lee has argued, quote, that the imprint left by immigration will feature prominently as the archaeology of the modern Irish mind comes to be excavated." End quote. In their chapter on immigration and exile uh, in Irish Studies and Introductions, published over 20 years ago, uh, Chris Curtin, Reno Dwyer and Gareth Cooley write that, quote, We cannot ignore the fact that emigration has been a central part of the Irish experience, arguably the single most uh, aspect uh, through from the 1830s through to the present generation. It may not explain fully every development or any facet of social change in Ireland throughout this period, but no satisfactory explanation of anything can be undertaken without reference to it. Not surprisingly, they then continue, it is also a major theme of Irish literature, not only in the works of Irish of the major writers, but also the vast repertoire of songs, ballads and stories. This paper is a preliminary examination of representation of emigrant pathways in the literary writings of uh, Miles McGopoline, Flood O'Brien, Brian O'Nolan, Brian O'Nolan, how we want to represent him, and uh, Marisha Sullivan. And it's also an examination of how different Ireland's compete and occupy the same space, whether it's in the construction of the Gale Club in the years after the foundation of the Free State in 22, or in Ireland constructed through accent and languages overseas. It is therefore an exploration to the connections between a mobile ga Gaelic and diasporic spaces of Irishness. With a focus on the construction and deconstruction of Gaelic space and immigrant pathways in the fictional autobiography on Bale Boch, this paper seeks to explore uh, Brielle Nuelon's challenge to such constructions of a spatially determined identity politics that restrictively aligned, defined and confined people to place in post-partition Ireland. In particular, the visual register of such space as represented in the map of Angela Moor, drawn to accompany the original Irish language version of the novel in 41 by the artist Sean O'Sullivan, will provide the main uh, anchor and focus of the paper. While much work has been done on the construction of Ireland, and in particular in the west of Ireland, and we've uh, heard from Kevin about that uh, earlier, in terms of the literary and visual representations, it has also received attention by cultural geographers in recent years. The West of Ireland in particular has thus had a complex geo-history and from the time of the cultural revivals of the 1880s and 90s it was signalled as being a homogenous spatial unit for interstates of tradition and modernity could be measured. As Neela Johnson uh, has noted, the Western seaboard has been cultivated through the various practices of anthropological, antiquarian and ethnographic research. Uh, and indeed, you know, we're, we're very familiar with these kinds of images from the Irish Folklore Commission archive as well, uh, and how they become embedded in and of uh, this kind of archive uh, as well. The common results of such discourses on and of Ireland further consolidated the Western Seaboard as the site of the traditional, the authentic, with its inhabitants invariably represented as being monoglot Irish speakers, <coughs> as cultural signifiers and actual embodiments of Irishness. The idealisation of the Gilchrist regions meant that they, became, they came to represent the, wealth, the wellspring of language and Irishness, or as John Walsh describes it, Mar Hubbard the Chala of Eric as the wellspring of language and of Irishness. Poverty of condition, then, was, was directly proportionate to purity of spirit and, more importantly, for the writer's eloquence of language. However, the celebration and the reification of the Irish-speaking West in Devon Airs, Ireland was sharply undercut with the reality of unemployment and the experience of many households being, as Finchon O'Toole describes in 1994, trans as being transnational households. Uh, they are transnational, he argues, by virtue of, of having at least one immediate family member living overseas and occupying a, a transnational kind of locality. Therefore, one, one adds in, into this the instability of the place is demonstrated through the emigrant experience, in addition to the notion of fixed construction of Irish space, one comes up with a very different concept of space of Irishness. As Jerry Smith has argued, quote, Irish cultural nationalism constructed Irish identity in terms of a specific temporal and spiritual matrix, investing in notions of homeland, geographical community, observable borders between nations, as well as the idea of the present as part of the narrative linking national past onto national future. Emigration, however, upsets this matrix, fatally displacing the subject and received concepts of national space and time, end quote. 
The disruptive mechanism then of emigration in terms of the continuity of national space and its people is also noted by O'Toole in his essay, The Lie of the Land, Some Thoughts on the Map of Ireland. O'Toole writes, Emigration means quite simply that the people in the land are no longer coterminous. In this sense, the map of Ireland is a lie. The lie of the land is that there is a place called Ireland inhabited by the Irish people, a place with a history, a culture, and a society. Yet the central fact of that history is that over 150 years, much of it has happened elsewhere in Chicago, Coventry, in Boston, in Birmingham, in the House Kitchen, and Camden Town. The central fact of that society is that it is porous and diffuse and its apparent stability is maintained only at the cost of its continued export of its instabilities. Uh, the Gilgut from the Republic of Ireland today refers to areas of seven counties as designated state legislation. While concepts of the Irish-speaking regions have been in currency throughout Irish history, the Gilgut was originally defined as a result of a government report commissioned in 1925 and then set down uh, by the Gale of the Commission Report then uh, finally uh, published in 1926, headed by Richard Murphy. In their article using GIS to map the evolution of the Gale Cup, Ian Rennie Vrolick, uh, Stephen McCarran, John Walsh and Patrick Duffy, Duffy argue that, quote, the Gale Cup has never been a consolidated or significantly consolidating region. Several reviews of Gale Cup territorial definition have resulted in confusion about the precise extent of the Gale Cup which has persisted to this day. Despite successive legislative reviews, the authors argue that, quote, the spatial dimensions of the modern Gaelic largely reflect a geographical inertia in its territorial definition, end quote. And so it has been the case that since 56, some areas have been added to, but no areas have been removed. So I'm going to move from kind of an official version of fixedness and stability of Irishness to something a little bit uh, different. Uh, on Bill Books, uh, A Bad Story About the Hard Life was written by Brian O'Moolan, was published under his Irish and journalistic pseudonym Miles Scopoli in 1941, and later reprinted in English as the Portugal in 1964. The book is purportedly the edited version of the autobiography of the central character Bonaparte O'Kunissa, a very good typical Irish name, uh, beginning with his birth in the Gaelic region of Karkadarka and concluding with his meeting of his long lost father. Uh, when he's been sent away to jail, to, to jail in Sligo. Uh, and so one could argue this is the original jail talk novel. He got there before Brendan Bean. Uh, it's also self consciously in the context of uh, the Blasket Library, the, the repertoire of people uh, writing uh, in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, Pix Ayers, of course, comes to mind, also Korean, and Mercia Sullivan uh, as well. Uh, and in, in that, it's very much set as a parody of these kinds of texts coming out uh, of Ireland in this period and the whole question of editing dissemination and translation and as well. Uh, one of these, uh, so this is the Robert Bala version of Reno Nulan. On the Lawn of the Islandman, uh, one of the most famous uh, Blasket Island autobiographies. And again, kind of the, 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 the kind of iconography of it showing kind of man's kind of connection to the superiority of an over nature in one way you can go to uh, depict something else differently in the book itself. And then the other version of it, uh, where a man is being beaten by nature into submission uh, in different ways as well. Uh, so this is what Flood uh, uh, Brian is actually dealing with here. As literary historian Sarah McKibben notes, maps were, all, were often provided in the first few pages or end pages of Irish autobiographies and folklore collections, signalling their links to ethnographic and antiquarian attempts to secure Ireland and the Irish as an object of knowledge firmly under imperial control. In the mockery of solicitude, she argues, on Bale Bough, though not the poor mouth, includes a map of Ungao and Moore. And, and this is a very interesting point. So this, this map uh, is included in uh, the Irish language original version in 1941, but it's not subsequently reproduced in the English language translation. Mm -hmm. So there is obviously a connection between audience, kind of a linguistic audience, and, uh, and also the, the, the publication of it subsequently um, as well. The map of Adal Moore is not, quote, uh, from McKibben, the carefully delineated and rural structure of a conventional map, but that what we, what we have instead, she argues, is a topsy-turvy, highly subjective or perspectival world, unquote. Certainly the map does not give us any degree of certainty, but details to scale or uh, degrees of latitude and longitude seems being irrelevant. And on this map, the only orientation received is that all roads uh, lead west. And you can see from these roads, everything is drawing you to the west and the idea of the down here and everything that the west represents uh, ideologically, spiritually as well in many ways in terms of uh, moving towards uh, the idea of Tirnanog and this idea of liminal spaces 
blood up of heaven and talked about his very much present here as well. Uh, indeed, the putty or the cherubs of classic uh, cartographic convention are a case of two dancing girls, and again, an invocation of a particular form of kind of Gaelic league Irishness, uh, uh, robed in Irish dancing costumes. What we do have is a map legend or a key showing us the places of the Longhorned Cattle, which is the moment, the Sea Divided Gale, the, the Green Hills, invariably that are far away in America, there are no Green Hills in Ireland, uh, that are there in New York, Boston, Springfield, Massachusetts, and money order offices uh, in England, Scotland, and America as well. While this map may indeed be topsy turvy, its relationship to the received or official understanding of Gaelic space in this period may indeed be exactly the same as the relationship to the novel, to the Irish literary tradition and to contemporary concepts of Irishness at the time. As an exercise of parodying the conventions of, of native autobiography in the mode of what would later be termed as autoethnography, and I think you hear of uh, Mary Lee's Pratt's work uh, on autoethnography, as a purported view from the, from the inside out, a topsy-turvy map is thus, on the contrary, to be expected. The map is less topographically accurate representation of the Irish landscape than the construction of a mental map or mindscape of Rome Particulis's social and personal geography of Gaelthup and also of Edinburgh space. In the opening chapter of the novel, Wilconnison informs the reader as to the time and the place of his entry into the world. Quote, I was very young at the time I was born, and had not aged even a single day. For half a year I did not perceive anything about me, and did not know one person from the other. Quote. While his house had predictably enough half rotten rough walls, it had an enviable panoramic view of Gaelic Ireland that could not be paralleled anywhere else in the country. That's the more extended quote. However, concerning the house where I was born, there was a fine view from it. It had two windows with a door between them. Looking out from the right hand window, there before was the bare, hungry countryside of the Rosses and Guidor. Looking out of the door, you could see the west of, of County Galway and good portions of rocks of Connemara. And to the left, you could see the Great Blasket. It has always been said that there is no view from any house in Ireland comparable to this, and it must be admitted that this statement is true. So from the outside of his door, you can see going from Donegal across to the west and then further down to the southwest of Ireland. So again, there's compression of space and time. In placing the islands of Tory, Oran, and Blasket Moor in a seemingly impossible close proximity, the map illustrates the unrealistic homogenizing rhetoric of official Ireland in grouping the, the, the various Gaelic regions as occupying one approximate space. Uh, and the three islands are here depicted in occupying three space, almost as if there are the three Aran islands in uh, particular here. This collapsing of space in Avail Buck is a direct parody of the earlier uh, autobiography by Virgil Sullivan, Fingerly and McFalls, 20 years ago, published in both Irish and English in 1933. In one, section, in one section of O'Sullivan's book, he reports that behind on Glasgow Moor, the Great Blasket, one can see the glittering lights of New York, Boston, and Springfield, Massachusetts, the main emigrant destination of Glasgow Islanders, and particularly after the final evacuation or abandonment of the island in 1953. It is interesting to note that for O'Sullivan in 1933, the proximity or coterminous nature of island space to diasporic space is a central concern, and this space is much closer than the space, the relation between the island and Ireland itself. Ireland is a space rarely is kind of seen as being somewhere else. Uh, the imaginative geography makes the, the, the Blasket space much closer to the east coast of America than it does to uh, the west coast of West Kerry. Uh, indeed, in the Blasket Island Centre in the Queen and Kerry, uh, the section that's devoted to uh, the Blasket Island uh, books and autobiographies. There's a section on a wall space foregrounded uh, with an image of the, the Great Blasket, but it's overlaid with uh, skyscrapers from Manhattan Island that loom large and frame the island in the background itself. It's very interesting in the exhibition, at the end of the exhibition space as well, there's a whole room dedicated to uh, emigrant letters, remittances, oral histories as well, and again aligning uh, the, uh, the Blasket Islanders with uh, a diasporic space rather than an Irish space in this period as well. Um, while the mapping of, of Gaelic space is parodied in the novel, it is meeting counteracting with the cartographic opening up of Gael in Gaelic space and other unexpected destinations, i.e. non-Irish non diasporic geographies. Uh, I'll just go through very quickly with this. Uh, Harlar meaning overseas, and you have the uh, glosses of there, the Green Hills, 
uh, New York, New York, Boston, Springfield, Massachusetts, and the New Order office again. And again, these are all the, the sites that occupy the, the geographical imagination of, uh, of both characters in the novel, but also uh, people that were living uh, on, in this part of Ireland uh, in this period. As a product and version then, of the static and fixed rhetoric of Gaelic fate, as noted by Gerald Kuhig, it has been argued here that O'Sullivan's map and O'Neill's text not only self-consciously play with those conventions, but work together to subvert and challenge the prescribed boundaries of Gaelic and diasporic space. This occurs through a dynamic concept of what reflexively constitutes Irish, Gaelic and diasporic space, rather than the dominant static model as adopted by the state in the and that arguably continues to this day. While the map may blur the lines between the fictive and the real, it may be shown that what is initially regarded as fiction is in fact a lot closer to the truth than one may think. In conclusion, in 1991, Eamon O'Keefe argues that the Gale Cuff quote is not a place, or it is not only a place, it is the people, the community of native Irish speakers, the community exists inside and outside the fixed boundaries of the map. A new map of the Gale Cuff, however, would extend beyond the boundaries of the west of Ireland, or indeed of the state itself, to include the diaspora in Britain, in the United States, Australia, and beyond, end quote. In creating this new map, all a key song would have to do would be to take his cue from O'Sullivan and with a little updating from the map of O'Donnell here, which gave the sea divided Gael and the Irish speakers outside the official Gaelic regions their rightful place in history, an acknowledgement of their own place in time. But, however, with the one note that the compass should always point west, of course, at all times. Thank you.